Well, hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to Voices in My Head, episode 35. We're on episode 35. We've been around for a long time doing this show. Today's special guest is Adam Werner. He is a really cool guy who talks about audiobooks and all the ways and stuff that he got into audiobooks with Basil. Now, one, one technical note we have to give is that there's a little bit of echoiness in this show. Uh, it's a technical glitch we tried to fix, but it seems that the echoey demon has stayed there this time around and we couldn't get him out but it's still a good interview and it's still some really good information that adam gives both for existing and up and coming narrators and all that kind of stuff because he's a really cool guy and all that well anyway on with the show take it basil hey ladies and gentlemen welcome back to another episode of voices in my head today we have a great guest mr adam verner hello adam adam is a awesome narrator with a lot of books out there been doing this for a little while apparently um either that or he's just a really fast reader in proper time so adam how long have you been doing audiobooks well um i did my very first book back in 2005. Mm. so way before the acx boom the the influx of home booths and all that stuff yeah i I think it's been weird. It's been a weird journey because I've straddled the divide to some extent. Uh, not, you know, I don't have as much experience in the back end as some of your other guests have had. We've been doing it for 20, you know, over years or whatever. But so my journey into it was interesting because I only worked for one company in their studio, Oasis Audio, up there outside of Chicago. Um, because I, at the time I was pursuing theater in Chicago. As an actor, and I knew I always wanted to do audiobooks, just didn't quite know how to break in. Mm -hmm. So back in 2005, I'd been in Chicago three years or so, just doing the theater thing, you know, working crappy day jobs and catering and hanging lights for theater, whatever I could do to make money and stay alive and, and pursue theater. And um, had got into voiceover a little bit, uh, had a couple agents for voiceover, and was doing some commercial voiceover. <clears throat> and then, and this is unusual, especially these days. I got an audition for this audiobook through my agent. Oh, wow. Yeah, yeah and at the time, uh, Oasis only worked with local people. You know, they brought you out to their studios in Carroll Stream, out an hour outside of Chicago, and recruited you there with a kind of engineer slash director. Right. Um, the old model. Uh, and I think they were running auditions through this agency. Partly they just wanted some new faces, and partly they needed an uh, English accent, um, which... And in retrospect, you know, now I, I wouldn't accept a uh, 17 finish hour book where the main narrator and the main voice character was English. Um, there's just there's enough Brits in the industry, and you know, and there's just no need for an American to do that. Um, but at the time, you know, I took it because I was like, great, I know English. I you know studied dialect in college theater classes and had done plenty of Oscar Wilde and Shakespeare. Uh, plays in English accent. So the first three books I did for this company were, gosh, 15, 16, 18, 19 hour kind of wow. historical wow. fantasy epics set in, I think it was 11th century England, because mm. um, it was a retelling of the Robin Hood legend. Mm. So, so, interesting. Yeah, yeah great stuff, but all English accent, you know, nor, you know, the French influenced the North because the Normans were invading, and then the Welsh, and then the Scotland, and, and it was, it was a baptism by fire. That's a, that's a lot to handle. I mean, yes. even if you think you can do one or two British accents well, to be able to hit dialects consistently throughout a book that long, that must have been a nightmare uh, early on. Yeah, yeah it didn't seem like at the time, time it was also new. new. I was like, oh, this is just what people do, you know? Mm. Um, and, 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 and when I listen back to it now, I'm like, oh, that was not, not so good, good. You, you know, know but I think everyone thinks that about, about. The pretty first much part. everything that you do. Yeah. 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 That makes sense. Mm -hmm. So do, you went to college for theater? Yeah, I went to Bradley University, which is a small school down in Peoria, Illinois, um, which is interesting that I ended up doing what I'm doing now because I, the reason I went to Bradley, uh, I grew up in a small town called Dixon, Illinois, which is um, in the kind of middle of the state, three hours from Chicago, roughly. Uh, I, had I, I did a speech team all through high school, um, in addition to theater, but my main event as captain of the forensics team, the speech team, was a prose reading, you know, reading prose. Um, and I loved it, because I grew up doing, I grew up without TV, I just grew up reading books, and 
that, that was my passion. passion. So, so that's why I went to Bradley because at the time, and I think they, st- I, th- I think they're still up there, but they had the number one speech team in the country. Mm. Uh, and then they happened to be a couple hours from my house. Wow. <clears throat> so I didn't even really apply anywhere else. I just like, I don't want to go to Bradley. Mm. Um, and it was a great school. I had a great time. I only did one semester of my freshman year on the speech team because it was terrible. Um, I mean, not quality-wise, they were amazing, but because it was so competitive, it was that kind of like doggy dog. Right, right. You had to compete within the team to even compete at a tournament. You had to beat out your fellow teammates. And so all the internal politics of all that, I mean, it was just not... It wasn't an easy place to make friends, it sounds like. No, no. no. And, and, you know, know there were wonderful people, people there doing wonderful things. But as a freshman, first semester, semester coming from a small town, it was just way too much for me. Um, and then I was like, oh, here's this theater department, and they're doing plays where they all love each other and support each other and, and encourage each other to grow creatively. That looks good. Um, so much to the chagrin of my parents, since my, my grandparents met doing theater and my parents met doing theater, and when my mom had brought me up, Stay, stay away, away from, from theater, theater and acting. <laughs> so, <laughs> of course, you know, you tell a kid not to do something. Um, I ended up in the theater department there, graduated with a theater major, um, bumped around the country a little bit, but I ended up in Chicago in 2002 or three or so. Um, and then eventually I uh, got my master's of fine arts and acting there at the Chicago College for the Performing Arts at Roosevelt University. That's a long name. That's hard to fit yeah. on a business card. Exactly. We just call it Roosevelt. Oh, they, were, they wanted us to call it because it was technically a conservatory attached to this larger you know, university. Um, so I did that grad school there from 2006 to 2009. Hmm. So yeah. Have you done a whole lot of stage work? Um, not since then. I mean, a little bit because 2009 to 10 were crazy for me because I just finished three years of intense kind of theatrical grad school training. Uh, bought, bought a booth, you know, know rented an office, jumped, jumped into full time voiceover and audiobook work, got, got married, uh, uh, met, 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 engaged, engaged and married my wife in 11 months. months. Wow. Um, all within this, this like, like 16, 16 month period. period. Mm-hmm. So, so, lots of crazy risk taking and, and crazy stuff going on there. there. So, so, theater kind of took a back burner pretty quickly just because of finances. Acting is in my blood and always will be, but that kind of full time theater grind. Especially when I just knew I wanted to, I was about to get married and start having kids. Yeah. I'm like, yeah. Mm. yeah. It's good that you saw that because I mean, I think that's a reason that a lot of stage actors, stand up comics, all that stuff, their lives fall apart the, the longer they stay mm-hmm. in it because it's just, you know, unless you want to be a lifelong bachelor, it's, it's hard stuff. <laughs> it's tough, but I've been so blessed and lucky because. You know, making making a full time living doing voice work is hard, no matter where you are. Right, right. Or who you are. Um, but that I went full time in two thousand nine, so it's been about nine years now. Mm-hmm. Nine years. And um, it's been enough to pay the bills, and we've had you know we had three kids in five years. Um, yeah, about it's good to bunch two, them close because you'll suddenly be free all at the same time, and suddenly realize, wow, I got a lot of money. I'm going through that part right now myself. <laughs> In theory, except we we started later, you know. Ah, there you go. So we weren't, you know, we were 32 when we got married. Ah. So um, unlike some of our friends who got married and had kids at 22, we're kind of like that's me. So. I mean, yeah, 10 years behind the curve. So when our kids are actually all gone, we're going to be like 67. You know, we're gonna be good. Oh well. You know. Oh well. It is what it is. Uh, it is what it is. Yeah. yeah. Is there an aspect? How would you compare the? audiobook narration because I mean basically it's a play it's a it's a theater of the mind how would you compare that with stage acting oh gosh <clears throat> I mean when, when it comes, comes down, down to it and, and I tell when, when I teach now and then I tell, I tell this to students you know it, it's all acting hmm. um, there's, there's different, different frameworks you can put around acting commercial voiceover is also acting, acting. right um, you know, e-learning, e-learning medical narration is acting. Um, audiobooks are acting. All, they're all acting, which is just putting yourself in imaginary circumstance um, and living out in the believability of the moment. Um, I mean, the, this is, goes without saying, it's kind of obvious, but the glaring difference is that in theater, you have the joy and the pleasure 
uh, uh, working off of someone else's energy, off of someone else's presence. You have the give and the take, and that's what I really miss um, about theater is you're with real people. Right. <laughs> um, and as I'm sure you understand, and, and other people have interviewed to even do this kind of work in a booth for you know six to eight hours a day for nine years you have to have a certain kind of personality which i do right um, i love books and i'm kind of an introvert and i have great extrovert skills that i can turn on to turn on when i need them um but i miss the interaction of theater which is why i did a show here out in colorado last year um which is amazing and wonderful and i'll probably do it maybe once a year now we'll see it's all schedule um, we're working off the schedule, but it's, it's the interaction of people, which when you're doing audio books, it's all taking place in your head. And, you know, I, I still feel like I'm interacting with people to some extent because I'm playing different characters. So I feel that it's just, you know, it's just not the same. And the unpredictability of, of performing for a live audience, um, things like that. I mean, you just can't, <coughs> I feel like. Storytelling is the kind of the primal base performance style of all humanity. Um, you know, if you look back to prehistoric humans, the only kind of art form that they were doing back then was storytelling. I think I, I don't. You'd have to talk to an anthropologist, but I think oral storytelling came before uh, before painting on cave walls, probably. Um, so that's like the primal form of like. You can you can put it on stage and add lights and costume and sounds, but before all of that, it was just two, you know, a group of people sitting around a fire and saying, "Guess what I saw today?" Right, right. Saber tooth tiger and like leading the, someone through the story. So for me, it's really cool to just get back to that, just you and, and one person, which in this case happens to be imaginary, right? An imaginary listener. Um, but that's what keeps me going is storytelling because I like as I mentioned I. Grew up without a TV for the most part. My um, and my parents had split up when I was very young. So my dad, who was an actor, as I mentioned, also in radio, did radio just stock jockey stuff all over the uh, American Southwest. He had moved out to California. So every couple months, he would send me two, three cassette tapes of him reading books. Because um, he had this, you know, old school, late 70s, early 80s home setup to do recordings. Um, and he would read, you know, the kids' golden books or little kids' books, and he would read them and produce them, even with some sound effects and stuff, and put in, master them all to a CD, uh, cassette, not a CD, sorry, cassette. And I would listen to them in my little play school um, cassette player. So from a very young age, I grew up listening to spoken word, and also what that what kind of connects that was my only connection with my father. You know, was hearing his voice over this thing. So he did that. Yeah, yeah, and when, when I get all philosophical and modeling about it, I think like, oh, maybe that can be, I can do that for other people or lost mm -hmm. people or hurting people or whatever. You know, not every not every book is going to be that kind of touching, amazing moment. But um, <laughs> it's in, in an ideal world, that's kind of my dream, and that's what I strive for. Right. Well, it sounds like you planted the seed in there, and then you've got the the genetic <coughs> acting gene that's in you there that uh, just got mm -hmm. passed down from generation to generation by the sound of it. Yeah. yeah. So, so um, you were in Chicago, you were started the stuff there, you were doing it live there. What brought mm -hmm. you to Colorado? Um, it was, it's been almost exactly like three years ago now. So, so when was that 2015? We, we had had two, two children, children by that point, point and um, my, my wife is, is from Florida, Florida mm -hmm. and Living through Chicago winters every winter, you know, just not easy. She gets so depressed. Um, I was used to it because I grew up in the Midwest. Um, so a combination of weather is honestly a big part of it. Um, and then family. Uh, so her parents were from Tampa or had grown up. Yeah, they were spending most of their adult life in Tampa, Tallahassee and Tampa. And then they were going to retire. And we had kind of talked about moving somewhere with a lot more nature, where we could raise our kids. It wasn't the city because we lived in the city of Chicago. And a third floor walk up, you know, and with two little kids, and you got to park sometimes six blocks away and carry, you know, to carry your 18 bags of groceries through the three feet of snow. Um, wow. You know, multiple shootings around us, and then somebody stabbed to death in our apartment, and um, we won't go into detail on that, but lots of crazy things. Um, and we love Chicago. I still I miss it tremendously. But all of that combined, we were like, we need to go somewhere where there's more nature and the sunshine and 
it was, you know, for me, for my career, I was like, well, I want to go to New York um, or L.A. Those are kind of like, you know, if I want to, you know, work some, some other audiobook companies and, and kind of advance my voice over an audiobook career. But we didn't really want to move to another urban center because we were just done for that for now. Right. And we talked about Colorado, just kind of hypothetically. And then my wife, Leslie, her parents uh, volunteered a summer to uh, up here at Rocky Mountain National Park. Um, and, and they, they kind of fell in love with it, and they were like, so, so unbeknownst, unbeknownst to each other, we were both thinking about it. it. And um, they, they said, well, we, we might move out there if, if, if you guys would consider moving out there. there. And, and we said, said well, that's, that's what we were going to just say to you. We, we'd, we'd move, move out there, you move out there. So, so <clears throat> like fate, destiny. Yeah. God had that plan for you already. Yeah. So it took us a year longer than we thought because we were going to move out here earlier. And then we got pregnant again. I had to wait another year. Um, for financial reasons and whatnot. Oh, yeah. uh, finally got out here in 2015. Uh, so we live in Fort Collins, and they live in Grand Lake, which is a little mountain town about three hours away from here, <coughs> which is beautiful. Um, so it's it's been tough because I really miss, you know, just the, well, I'm sure you imagine being in Alaska, and the lack of huge artistic community all around you all the time, lots of culture, you know. We, it's, it, we're still, I mean, it feels, it's been three years, but it's still, it's been a very tough adjustment just from, just the lifestyle is slower, you know, um, the culture is so different. Uh, I didn't quite realize how urbanized we'd become, really, because we were there for, or I was there for, you know, a good 14-ish years. Right, right. My wife, most of that time, she spent five years living in China before we met. Oh, neat. So, yeah, but it's a, this is a wonderful place to raise, you know, raise our three kids now, they're... We're a 20 minute drive from the you just drive up 20 minutes here in your mountains in an amazing hiking area. There you go. So, there you go. No, yes. yeah. So, you're working out of your home now, I'm assuming, for pretty much all of it, or you do you still travel out to, to big studios? Um, I, it's mostly all from home now. Uh, when I was in Chicago, obviously, especially getting started, I was only doing going to studios and stuff like that. It wasn't until 2009 when I rented an office. I had a tiny little condo in Chicago right next to the train. I mean, there was just no way to do any kind of recording there. So I had to rent another office in a quieter neighborhood, 45-minute commute from my apartment, um, to put a whisper room in. <clears throat> and that was, we, I, I dealt with that for, gosh, five years, roughly. Oh, wow. Um, and it was, there were drawbacks and things like that, but it was, it, it was functional. Um, and it still would go to all of you know, my agent's offices or, or studios throughout Chicago to do stuff or even up to Milwaukee. But yeah, since we moved out here, you know, I have a Denver talent agent here. So a couple times a year so far, I'll go to one of the studios in Boulder or in Denver to record a, a radio commercial or you know, TV stuff, things like that. But it's not as much as Chicago. But on the other hand, I've saved so much time uh, taking the train all around creation in Chicago, you know. You know, you, know, you can, can imagine as an audiobook narrator, if I get into my studio, I'm like, all right, I got to get two or three finish hours done today. Right. Oh, oh and then I get a call from my agent. Oh, I got to go downtown for an audition. Well, that's an hour on the train downtown. They're usually running behind, hour to hour and a half to two hours to do the audition. Come back, and you waste half to three quarters of the day for an audition. Right, right. And you're like, oh, well, there goes my day of recording audio. And now it pushes off the schedule all back and back and back. So it was just a nightmare coordinating, trying to be a you know, commercial working voiceover talent, right? as well as a full-time audiobook narrator. I, still, I do all my auditioning here from home, like like most of us now. Most of the, you know, even in the big cities, most of the auditioning is done at home. Um, yeah, it's nice to when I get a job at one of these studios. Now it's it's, it's I consider it like a vacation. I get to get out of the house. I you know, right, right. drive into the city and, and see people and work with them. You know, behind the class and have a, and that's a I mean it's just a blast. And but I, again, go ahead. Um, you just you, you don't, don't have control over that, you know. Right. Could, right. You could get three in a month or three in a year. And who knows? Right. Right. Now, and that leads me to my next question: Do you find that having gone from working mainly in studios to working primarily in your own booth at home, do you find that you tend to work more, tend to isolate yourself more in the booth because it's right there and you can continue working? Um, not in terms of like the actual amount of time I spend working like in a day, um, not so much, mainly because, you know, I have three little children, one, three, and five, uh, and my wife currently is currently staying at home with them. 
also writing a book and trying to be a writer mm. at the same time as being a full-time mom. Um, <laughs> that's hard, especially in that yeah. age range. That's yeah. not where the kids never leave your side. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I, I'm pretty good about sticking to a, like, you know, I'm in, the, I'm in my office at 9.01, and then I'm or 9 o'clock, and I'm done at 4.59 for the 30-second walk across the garage. Right. Uh, yeah. Well, that's pretty good. That's good self-discipline. That, that was something that I read about in a, a study of work-at-home employees of, of any kind of business, that they would tend to do more extra hours work without charging for overtime just because mm -hmm. it was there. And they could easily do it, and they would find themselves working way more than when they had to commute to an office. I could, I, I mean, I would definitely see that with me if I were single. Yeah. Um, but, you know, there, there's just no time for that. Right. Um, you know, now, now and then, if I, if I get an important email in the evening or over the weekend or something, I'll respond to some emails. Um, but, you know, I, my wife and I have been married seven years. I think there's only been one day in seven years that I've had to work a couple hours on a weekend. Oh, wow. Uh, yeah, because it's just, yeah, it's not worth it. Like, our, our time as a family is more important. Um, that's really good to hear. That, that really is. You know, that's the thing that's missing in a lot of culture in our country today. <laughs> But, you know, putting the family first is awesome. Yeah. Well, and, but the nice thing is the flexibility is there. You know, if, right. If, if for some crazy reason some, a client needed some e-learning or something recorded in the evening because they're in a different time zone, we can, we can make it work if we need to. Right. Right. Yeah. Now, you've got, I'm looking on Audible, you got about you got 268 titles on Audible itself. Mm -hmm. uh, an amazing cross-genre stable of work here uh, a large percentage of uh, uh, christian titles a large percentage of thrillers uh, fiction and just about everything in between there we kind of fluttered all mm -hmm. over the place do you have a preference of genres that you like to do or um any anything fiction related i would put as my my preference just because of my acting background and the chance to do characters and you know my favorite genre of fiction to read generally is well-written fantasy and science fiction, um, and also some literary fiction. So those genres are just so much fun for me. Um, but the characters tend to be a little broader, right? A little more crazy, you know. Um, so I love doing that stuff. Um, that's not that's, that's not by any means like what I do. Though. Mainly, I get hired, as you've seen, I get hired to do just about everything. Right. Um, but anything fiction-related is my favorite. Um, I've been doing a lot of thrillers these days in the last six months for whatever reason um and then those are a lot of fun but other than fiction i, I love the um geeky geeky layman science kind of stuff you know which i don't get a lot of um but i did one last year called uh, the ends of the world which is this long kind of survey of the five mass extinction mass extinctions throughout uh, earth history you know, what, what caused them and you know all the scientific stuff which is a lot of research but, um, <laughs> I mean, I, that's also the kind of stuff I like to read, you know, I, um, I love reading those kind of nonfiction, uh, what's a good example, like The Emperor of All Maladies, it was a book about cancer and cancer research, but, so not, not so scientific or technical, but it's over your head, it has to be kind of written for the layperson, but I love, I love doing that stuff, um, <clears throat> when I first got started in 2005 up until 2010, you know, I was kind of the young guy voice, I was doing a lot of, if it was nonfiction, it was written by a young guy, they'd cast me, or I do, you know, now I'm about to be 40. Um, but, so I think I'll, I'm, in the next five years, be maybe moving into an older age bracket, maybe, I don't know. Right, it's like yourself doing some gritty noir yeah. thrillers or something down the road. And is there a book that you've read or someone else has recorded or narrated that you wish that you had had a chance to do? Mm. I, if I can cross gender lines. <laughs> that seems to be pretty common these days, so go for it. Yeah. Um, I noticed, uh, I forget what company, I think it was Brilliance. Some company recently uh, obviously got the rights to do all of uh, Madeline Lengel's work. Oh, nice. Wrinkle in Time. This was, yeah, Wrinkle in Time, author of Wrinkle in Time. And I, I read her stuff when I was little, but her nonfiction, I still love. Mm. I don't know if you've ever read any of her nonfiction no, stuff. No, I haven't. Um, really good, 
journals and memoir type stuff about her life and, th and faith and work and writing and what it means to be a writer and all that kind of artistic frou frou stuff. Um, so they were producing all of her books and I was seeing people on social media, you know, on Facebook, on some of these Facebook narrative groups being like, oh, I get to do 10 of her books and my favorite, you know, I was mentioning some of my favorites and I was just like, oh, I wish I were a woman um, and I could record those books. Um, and then I actually got an audition from the same company for one of her fiction books, um, I think because it had a male protagonist and I didn't get it, um, which is disappointing. But uh, yeah, there was, um, do you know the book Silence by Shishako Endo? I've heard of it. I haven't read it, but I have heard of it. Um, Martin Scorsese made a movie out of it last year or the year before, I think, which may have brought it to some more people's attention. Um, but it's one of my favorite books of all time, and years ago, this was 2006 or seven. I remember seeing there was no audio version, and uh, approached a publisher on it, and was like, this needs to be an audio, and they're like, oh, let's check on it. Um, and they got back to me, and they were like, oh, we just missed it, the rights got snapped up by um, BBC Audio at the time, before they became Audio Go. Um, they like, snapped it up, they cast a Brit, you know. Um, it's like, oh, dang it. And they said, well, but we but we did get the rights to all this other stuff. Oh, or to distribute it in CD or anyway. They they still got something from the deal. Right, right. Um, so there's been a number of books like that that I'm just like, oh. Do you find yourself listening to audio books? Or do you prefer to just read the book yourself? Um, I, I try as much as I can. But again, with, with little children, when, when, when and no commute, when would I do that? That's true. That's you know, I mean, I'm working nine to five, and I'm with my family every other waking hour. It's like, yeah. And, 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 and then a few times the kids are sleeping, I want to be with my wife. So <laughs> again, the, at this stage of life, there's just no time. Um, now that being said, I, because it's good for my profession, I do as much as I can. Like we have a every time we have a road trip schedule, I try and line up two to three audio books. Um, Especially because we tend to drive back to Chicago area and we drive overnight, so we switch, we take turns driving through the night. So, you know, I have six to eight hours of a 13 hour drive or something to just listen. Right, right. So, and I've listened to some amazing things. Um, for me, I'm very picky though, not always based on the narrator, um, it's usually based on the, the story and then the author. Um, and I, I found that some titles that I love to read in print, uh, I'll go pick up like the second version or the second volume of it in audio, and even though I like the author and I like the narrator, it just doesn't hold my interest because of the format now being audio. Mm, I see. Uh, I, can't, I can't quite pin down exactly why. It's a very subjective thing. Um, one series I really enjoyed listening to in audio is the, uh, what is it again, the series name? It's by Pierce Brown, Iron, um, the new the one that just came out, um, Red Rising. The, the color, color series um, um, set on Mars in the future, anyway, sci fi series, really well written. And, and that I transitioned in the like Kindle Whisper Sync version back to um, Jim Gerard Reynolds narrating the audio version, and he just did a fantastic job at it. Um, so I listened to pretty much all three of those. And since the fourth one just came out, and we have a road trip coming up at the end of May, I'm, getting, I'm like purposely not letting myself check the book out of the library because I want to listen to it on audio. There you go. There you go. Yeah. That's an awesome way to do it. Well, my, my leprechaun roommates uh, said that they wanted to come up and chat with you a little bit. And, All right. Uh, so I'm going to let them. Uh, here they come. Come on in, guys. Hi, hey, Mr. Basil. Welcome. Oh, no. We welcome. You welcome us. Welcome, boys. Come in. Okay, here we go. And let's close that door. And uh, so you guys got a question for Mr. Werner? Yeah, we got a question for Mr. Werner. Hi, I my name is Neely. I'm the second of the four brothers. There's four of us. Uh, 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 Feely is our oldest brother. Neely, that's me. I'm the second brother. Boffin is the third brother. And Berthold, he's the fourth brother. He's the smart one. But anyway, we don't pay much attention to him because he talks with big words. But we have a question for you. Ask away. When Basil looked up your name on, on, on Skype, it came up with a whole lot of Adam Werners, almost all of them from Czechoslovakia and, and, and Hungary and places that had things in their language that go like that. And Neat. are you from there? Uh, good question. As far, well, my uncle, uh, who's big into genealogy, 
traced, traced our family back. And this is my mom's side. So my mom's side, their name is Hartzell. Um, and my dad's side is the Werner, which is originally spelled with a W as Werner. Um, it's, oh, so tricky. So you should be you should be double Werner. Probably yes. But both sides of the family very very German. Um, ah. And my, my dad's side, because as I mentioned, my parents split up when I was young. I don't know as much about them, but my mom's side, the Hartzells, my uncle traced us all back to 1540 something in Germany. Um, oh, the same my, year my oldest brother was born. Yeah. yeah. That we live a long time. But uh, sorry for interrupting. No, it's okay. So, so as far as I know, I mean, there, I know there's a little bit of Norwegian in there. Um, but it's primarily German, and my, my, my wife's family primarily German. I guess we just like to keep it in the, the German nationality. Keep it in the genetic gene pool. Yeah, yeah, yeah not that's intentionally. But that's how it happens. Well, that's, that's very interesting. And so now you live in, in Colorado. How do you really yeah. pronounce that? Because I told my brothers it's Colorado. And one of my brothers said it's Colorado, and another one said it's not that cold anyway. So I don't know which one it is. Oh, good. you're hitting upon a very uh, much talked about thing. Um, really? Other people talk about that? Yes, yes, but they usually talk about the difference between Colorado and Colorado. Uh, which, when we first moved out here, I decided to do my research and. You can find any number of sources online that say, oh, it should be this, or oh, it should be that. Um, and I decided to go with some of the local news stations. One of the Denver local TV stations had a, has a, had a whole page devoted to it and said that both are correct, both are used, even in the state, both are used. But in their experience of being a local TV station, the slight majority of people said Colorado. Ah, give it that little French inflection. Oh. I get it. Colorado, not Colorado. So um, that could be like a, a, a Broadway song. You say Colorado, I say Colorado. Let's yep, just yep. have a fight. So. Yeah. So, so, yeah, it's an interesting you place. Know, you, you talk about the weather. I mean, compared to the Midwest, <clears throat> I'm not sure how Alaska is, but in the Midwest, you know, it's, it'll snow in the winter and the snow just sticks around. Uh, uh, it just doesn't go, and, and then it gets all dirty and gray and slushy. Whereas here, you know, we'll get a, a foot of snow one day, even in January or February, and it'll just melt the next day. It's gone because the sun comes out and it's so intense and the air is so dry, it just it just melts it away. Wow, that's amazing. Yeah. The snow yeah. here, we'll get like a foot today, a foot tomorrow, two feet next week, and then it's 16 feet tall, and me and my brothers have to stand on each other's shoulders to get the mail. It's really yep. rough. Yeah, yeah, none of that. I mean, as, you, you could get a random blizzard out here where you have tons of snow, but it just doesn't stick around. And um, and then there's amount of sunshine. That's why. That's why we wanted to. That's why we wanted to choose Colorado because outside of Southern California and Florida, it gets the most sun. They get 300 days of sun a year. Wow. Um, compared to Chicago, which I think was 90 or something like that. I've seen pictures of Colorado with like sideways blown ice, with the wind. Is it that windy there, really? It can it can be they have they have what's called a, a, a I'm not going to remember how to pronounce it catabatic or catabatic wind, which is the term for a wind that comes off the mountains. Sounds like wind that turns you into a zombie or something. <laughs> yeah. it could, no, you're, you're thinking about the marijuana out here. That's a, that's a whole other oh whole another discussion. Um, <laughs> No, no, the wind, I don't know how exactly it happens but otherwise, but there's times of the year when the wind just rushes down off the highlands, off the mountains. And um, they also call it a Chinook wind for some reason. I'm not sure if those are two that, different things. That's actually a word up here that comes from here. Chinook wind means the wind that comes in the winter and knocks all the trees down. Yeah, they have that here. It, I think it's more probably down in the Denver area when just because of the way the mountains funnel the winds because we're an hour north of Denver so it doesn't get that bad out here but we can get very very windy days I haven't seen sideways blowing ice yet but. well no, no I was referring to that in Chicago oh, oh Chicago you're talking about Chicago sorry the lake yes. there and, the, and the wind blows and the ice looks like it's trying to stab people it, that is very much the case and um, most of the time I was in Chicago about, well, about half the time I live a block and a half two blocks from the lake uh, up on the north side of the city. So yeah, you would um, 
get, get on a train, train in the morning, morning and, it, and then you take the train, train you know, 10 minutes kind of inland away from the lake and the temperature would be 15 degree different sometimes. Wow. Yeah, yeah wow. it's crazy. It's like time travel trains, but weather yeah. travel yeah. instead. Yeah. Pretty that's, much. That's pretty amazing. Okay, I my, my brother Bertolt, he has a question. Remember, I said he's a smart one, so watch it. Uh, All right. He has a question he wants to ask you. Bertolt, yeah, I'm here. What you gonna ask Mr. Adam Werner, the double V Werner? He's he's a Werner Werner. Uh, why you talk like that? Anyway, here we go. Okay, Mr. Adam Werner, we have this scenario for you to try and solve. Okay. The scenario is you and your wife and your kids are traveling for the first time and they'd be a little bit older than they are now just because for safety reasons you wouldn't want to do this when they're young you're traveling out into the world on a vacation to a south pacific island and you can pick which island you want or make one up if you want and then all of a sudden the plane loses compression and drops out of the sky and you all jump into the parachutes and you're all saved and you land on the island what do you hope you have with you, other than your lovely family, or in addition to, I should say, uh, the, in addition to your lovely family, what would you like to have with you the most when you land on that island? Oh, I hate these questions. Because um, I could give the like really logical, intelligent, um, realistic, rational answer, which would be no fun. Um, Um, that's, that's a, a good, good question. question. I, I think, think I would want, want some kind of, kind of outside of, you know, know I, I, uh, I, could I could say any kind of survival, survival gear, be, radio be, beacon, be, water purification be, tablet, stuff like that, but that's no fun. So, <laughs> um, well, you can make um, them fun. One time, my brother Neely, he stuck his tongue in a water purification thing to see if it would get rid of his bad breath. Yeah, it didn't work. But everything tasted like pickles for like two years after that for him. Oh, crumb. Yeah, yeah, let's, let's get the water purification towels. towels. Um, I, I would have to say, say like, a, a Kindle loaded, loaded with all of Amazon and an indefinite, uh, never ending that battery. That, that would be all we need. need. That would be very good. That would, yes. Because then on the Kindle, too, if you could read a book that has a guy lost in an island and you find the script that says, hey, SOS, come rescue me, you could raise it to really large fonts and hold it up to airplanes and, well, they probably wouldn't see it. But anyway, you could do that. Yeah, and I could look up all sorts of survival stuff while I'm at it. But, oh, yeah, being stuck, being stuck on an island a nice without island. kind of reading material, I mean, for readaholics like myself, getting stuck anywhere without reading material is like a fate worse than death. Have you ever so, thought of writing your own reading material? I've thought about it. My wife has encouraged me to. It's just, you know, I've never tried. Um, and then, you know how they say everyone, you know, I've had lots of, I've had some ideas, but as they say, everyone has a book in them. Not everyone should write it. Um, <laughs> uh, my brother Buffin has a book in him, and it's not safe for public consumption at all. Mm. No, not that's going to take a while. It's just he's not. That's going to take a while to pass too. Yeah. Um, so I don't know. I mean, I've had some ideas. If I tried, it would be some fiction. But you know, I read. I, I do read lots of books about the creative process and the writing process because it interests me. And my wife is a writer, and I always hear the talk about like the um, what makes a writer a writer is that they must write. You know, it just it pours out of them. They can't stop it, and that gets a little arty frou frou. But I, I, I've never quite felt that that desire. I had that desire to tell stories and to read and experience stories. But as far as being a um, primary creator, you know, I do struggle with that as an actor too, because at the end of the day, I'm an interpreter. Um, oh, that's a neat way to say it. I'd never thought of that. Uh, I, you know, whether that's stage acting or audiobook narration, I'm taking someone else's primary work. They're the primary creator, and I'm just interpreting through my own creative lens, which is adding its own creative stamp to it in some way. But I'm not creating from whole cloth um, necessarily. So I, you know, I think later in, later in life, I have more time. Yeah, they well, not anymore. They used to it used to be. Animal skin, human skin sometimes, all sorts of stuff. You can write uh, it and you could also boil it and make soup. Uh, yeah, yeah. Maybe. 
not the human side. So, <laughs> we'll see, we'll see down the line. I, when I'm older and have more time, maybe. I would like to give it a try. But I'd be good. I'll narrate it for you if you like. I do a there good job. Go. As it says, I do a good job of talking. So. I will. I will only write about um, small Irish people. And well, thank you very much because it's a very important thing near and dear to my heart. And thank you for answering my question and not like freaking out and saying, "What the heck are you asking questions like that for?" Because uh, people do that sometimes. But. Uh, no but anyway, it's been fantastic meeting you. I have to go and cook dinner for the whole family of all of us. And all right. I have no idea. So we'll see you later. Thank you very much, Mr. Adam W. Werner. See you, leprechauns. OK, guys, you're out of here. Go on. Bye, Basil. Oh, by the way, don't be late for dinner. OK, OK, thank you. OK, so. Well, that's pretty much the show, and uh, thank you very much for being on and for, for being a good sport with the, the guys, and uh, yeah, great. It's great uh, to meet you in person a little bit more formally rather than in passing at an APAC, and, uh, yes. and I look forward to doing so again. Are, are you going to be there this May? I am not going to be here this year. I have... Uh, Sad to say, well, happy for me now to say, I'm getting a knee replacement this summer, and so I have no, no time to go and uh, got to save all the money, you know. So, yeah. But but once that's all done and, and my legs are back to we can walk around again, strength, then heck yeah, I'll be down there. So. Awesome. Can, you, can, can I, I put in a plug for, for the the new pronunciation website? website? Have you heard of this? Absolutely. Go ahead. Um. So. so uh, for those of you listening or watching, if you haven't seen me post all over Facebook about it yet, um, there's a new uh, pronunciation tool coming called Pronounceology, the study, the arc of pronunciation, um, pronounceology.com, and hoping to launch in May before APAC this year. We'll see. There's a, a lot to get done before then. But uh, in a nutshell, it allows you to do bulk searches of words and get back bulk phonetic pronunciations and audio. So it searches Merriam-Webster. Uh, Forvo, Oxford Dictionary, uh, other dictionaries to come when we can get them added. But um, it, uh, the nice streamlined part about it is that you can take your highlighted PDF of a manuscript, um, uh, upload it straight to the tool, it'll extract all your highlighted terms, whether that's 10 or 1,000, run them all through the dictionary, spit back out the phonetic spellings and the audio for you. Um, yeah, and then you can edit that to your heart's content or find your own, you know, for personal names that don't exist in the database, you can add your own phonetic spelling, uh, record your own pronunciations, and once you've got your report kind of done, you can then export just the phonetic spelling back to your PDF for narrating. Nice, so, man, that is a massive yes. research tool. That sounds pretty good. Is there, what what kind of fee range we're looking at for it? Um, that's what I'm still trying to figure out. It's, it's, it's a tough nut to crack because there's, there's so many different use cases. You know, a, a full-time mariner like, like myself would be using it probably in every book. Right. Um, you know, four to six books a month. Um, other people, as you know, do it part-time or only do a research-heavy book, non-fiction kind of thing, once or twice a year. So I'm trying to work out a couple different tiers of subscription, like have a, a basic one that's like up to 100 search terms a month for five or seven or eight dollars a month, something cheap. Mm. A middle tier for kind of a regular full-time working narrator that's like... 300-ish terms a month, which is probably a couple books worth what an average narrator would do in a month for 12-ish dollars a month. Mm -hmm. And then like an advanced tier for even like a full-time researcher to use it for mm -hmm. a thousand searches a month or 20 or 25 a month, 22, something like that. I'm trying, I'm trying, to, I'm trying to figure out what kind of the average search volume is for narrators and doing some research on that. Right. Right. That's probably how it's going to work. I've also thought about having a pay-per-use model where it's just a flat, like you don't have a subscription. It's just, hey, you you got this book that's got 120 ancient Proto-Indo-European terms in it. It's flat amount per term, you know, 10 cents a term, 15 cents a term, 20 cents a term. And then that way, it's the same for everyone. You know, you'll use it when you need it. And it's, you know, 40 bucks to do, to research a whole big book that'll save you, in the end, hundreds of dollars in your time. Right, right. Well, that's, so. that's pretty cool. I like that idea. I mean, that would... That would cut a lot of prep time off for independent narrators that don't have, you know, if you're doing a project, an ACX project, or or even a publisher project that doesn't have a, a prep office or prep team for you, that is pretty cool. Yeah, 
Yeah, yeah I'm, I'm hoping it'll be usable by everyone. Um, you know, even companies like Blackstone, who often do research for you, mm-hmm. if 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 their if their researchers or or their people want to use the tool, they'll be able to do all their work with it and then just share a shareable version of the report online with you. So rather than as they do it now, giving you a PDF and you have to look at the phonetic spelling. They can share this live version of the report with you, and you can click to play the audio or play their pronunciation and see the next. I mean, you'll be able to see it all there. A little more interactive than like a spreadsheet. Right, right. Oh, yeah. So. Man, that's an excellent tool. Yeah. Well, we'll see. And what's this like? So, pronunciology? It's just pronounceology. Pronounceology. So the word pronounce with ology. Pronounceology. Nice. Dot com. Makes it like a new uh, scientific term. Yeah, this is the this, this study of, you know. Naming the naming any kind of web thing these days is so hard because everything is taken. Right. Uh, right. Yeah. I tried my best to get pronunciation.com is available, but of course they wanted ten thousand dollars for it. Yeah. Uh, and then then I tried to get a uh, pronounce.it pronounce it. Mm. Which would have been great, but um, of course they wanted some crazy amount of money for it that is just not even feasible. Oh yeah. oh yeah, I can understand that. I can understand that. All right. Well. Uh, thank you very much. That's a very cool thing, and I'll make sure, you know, once you get that link, let me know, and I, I'll spread it out through this stuff, too. Because Go for it, yeah. I mean, the, the website is live right now in terms of you can watch a couple, like, teaser videos there and of how it works and see the tool in action and sign up for the uh, little email list to be kept appraised because I'll be sending out updates about new features we're adding and when it's launching, and, and that's all at pronounceology.com. Well, perfect. Then we got the link right down there in front of you. I should put my finger up here. There we go. Right down there in front of you. Go there. So, Sign up. We'll make sure that's there. And excellent. Thank you very much, Adam. Enjoy your time right. down in Colorado. And uh, we'll see you when we see you. We'll see you when we see you, man. Thank you. All right. Thanks. Well, that was definitely an interesting show. Adam is a, such a neat guy. What do you think, Gerald? I would think he is a very neat guy indeed. That's very correct, Gerald. By the way, I'm in the mood for Chinese food for dinner. What can you whip us up on Chinese food? Oh, no problem there, boss. We can get you some Mugu Gai Pan and some Kong Pao shrimps, maybe. Uh, what else would you like? Uh, do you do that Szechuan uh, Mongolian beef thing? Ah, uh, well, those are two separate things, but I could mix them together in one pot. Sure thing. Oh, good. I like all those things, especially the Mugui Gai Pen. Do you know that Mugui Gai Pen just sounds like a little baby describing their favorite pan when they're playing pots and pans? Mugui Gai Pen! Ah, uh, what? Anyway, this show is copyright 2018, Sandman Production Studios and Basil Sands and all that stuff. And, uh, have a wonderful day. This is Gerald, off to make Chinese food. Which is not really Chinese food, it's actually Americanized food made by Chinese persons of Chinese lineage. Uh, but it tastes fantastic anyway. Bye.